Hello. Now, today, we're going to do some IELTS speaking pronunciation practice. And together, we will take your understanding and practice of pronunciation up to a whole new level. Are you ready? Then come with me. Hi, so my name is Keith I'm from the Keith Speaking Academy. So today we're going to be practicing the key pronunciation features that you need to master to get a band seven, eight or nine in IELTS speaking. I'm going to be looking at phonemes, word stress, sentence stress, weak and strong forms, connected speech and intonation. <laughs> now, first of all, why is pronunciation important? Well, it is because you probably know pronunciation counts for 25% of your IELTS speaking mark, right? Now, have you ever looked at the IELTS speaking band descriptors? Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Keith, what, what, what are they? Well, if you don't know them, then you should go and find out. You can go to my website, there's a link be below, Go and look at the band descriptors, right? Because this is where you can find out how the examiner evaluates you and what they're looking for. Now, when we look at um, pronunciation, it comes up all the time, this phrase, pronunciation features, a wide range of, a limited range of, contr mixed control of pronunciation features. What on earth are these pronunciation features, right? That's what I need to know. Well, in a word, here they are. We've got word stress, connected speech, sentence stress, phonemes, intonation, weak firms, weak firms, weak forms and strong forms. In a nutshell, these are probably the most important pronunciation features you need to know and to master. And this is exactly what we're going to look at today. One by one. Blah. <laughs> Come on. So this is exactly what we're going to look at today. We'll look at them one by one so you understand what they are and we'll start getting you to use them correctly. So let's begin with phonemes. So phonemes are individual sounds, including vowel sounds like i, i, a, a, and consonant sounds like p, b, s, okay? So these are your phonemes. Basically, pronunciation exists on three different levels, right? You've got your sounds, your words, or your chunks and phrases, right? So sounds like k, a, p. Words like cup, put them together, k, a, p, cup. That's a, that's a word. Phrases like cup of tea, right? Putting all of these sounds together. Basically, there are 44 sounds in English. That's it. No more. Everything you will ever, ever say is just made with 44 different sounds. And here they are. This is the uh, phonemic chart um, created by Adrian Underhill. And also thank you to Macmillan Education who um, copyright this. And here you can see the different kinds of sounds, the 44 sounds in English. The top half is just the vowel sounds, right? And these are divided into the single vowels and the diphthongs, which are sliding vowel sounds. Then at the bottom, we've got all the consonant sounds. Now, what's interesting with this is that the sounds go from the front of the mouth to the back of the mouth, right? and from the top of the mouth to the bottom of the mouth. So you have at the start here, for example, e, i, o, u. And similarly, if you look at the consonants, the p, b, t, d, ch, j, k, g, going from the front of the mouth to the back of the mouth, right? And from the top to the bottom. Very interesting organization and really, really useful. Now, if you want to practice these, there is a very, very simple mobile app that you can use. So this is an app by the British Council. Um, it's called Sounds Right. 
and you can download it from their website. There is a link down below. And basically, as you can see here, you can click on the different sounds, for example, the vowel sounds and diphthongs to listen and try and repeat. You can also click on the consonant sounds again and repeat. And you also get example words with the different sounds. So you can see the kind of words that are using those sounds too. Now, a really important thing about pronunciation is it's not mental. It's not thinking and analytical. It's not like grammar, looking at patterns or vocabulary. It's physical. It's more like playing football or basketball, right? Or dancing, where you have to train your body to move in a certain way. Same with pronunciation. You have to train your mouth to move in a certain way. So I think the key thing and the key message here, right, is that you need to train, I should say retrain your mouth, right? Because you have learned to pronounce and to speak your mother tongue using the muscles you need to pronounce the mother tongue, right? Now, the muscles being the lips, the tongue, the jaw, and the voice or the unvoiced sounds. That's what you use to speak. So it's very, very hard to speak another language correctly with the correct pronunciation because you're using the familiar muscles and shapes that you've used your whole life. What you really need to do is to retrain your whole mouth. And I think it's really important when you're working on English learning to make pronunciation a regular part of your practice and to retrain, practice training your mouth. I'll be showing you a few examples in a moment. Have you ever tried something like a new sport? You know, I mean, I remember when I tried yoga for the first time, right? Um, and it was very difficult. I remember watching the teacher who would, you know, she would do a perfect pose. And then I would have a go and be like, nowhere near close. But the teacher, of course, would help me and would say, well, no, listen, when you're doing that, you need to stretch your arms. Oh, right. OK, like that. And she said, no, put your shoulder down. Right. And I go, oh, I see. But it feels strange. And she goes, of course, it feels strange. You're using new muscles in new ways. And it's exactly the same with pronunciation. Right. When I first learned Chinese, I had headaches for days and days because I was trying to use the shape of my mouth similar to the way Chinese people were. And it's used in a very different way, as with most languages, right? So we need to think about retraining your mouth. There are different ways of doing this. And I think probably the worst way is just to read stuff aloud because you're just going to repeat the bad pronunciation, right? Second way is you can listen to audio. Now, that's OK, because at least you have the sound and you're trying to imitate the sound, but you don't really know what's going on inside. So it's you're kind of guessing and you're probably repeating your mother tongue pronunciation. Much better is video, which is why I'm a big fan of video, right? Because whether it's teaching videos or Netflix or films, because you can see what's happening much more. You can see the shape of the lips, the position of the jaw. You can sometimes see the tongue. So videos help a lot so long as you're paying attention to what's going on here and comparing to yourself. So using a mirror to look at your own voice is really important, right? Your own mouth. But best of all is to have a coach or a teacher who can actually say, listen, you're doing this. You need to do this and to show you and help you change the shape and use different muscles to get the right sounds and then working and working on those sounds. For example, let's take the word party, right? And imagine a Spanish speaker, for example, would probably say party, party. And I would go, no, not party, but party. Take the first sound. You're saying pa, pa, but it's a p. 
In English, the p is aspirate. There's like a there's like a voice or a wind coming out. P. Look the difference between p, p, and p. <laughs> p. Right? You literally you're moving the paper, so you need to practice the p sound. Right? The second quite funny, right? So if you if you see st Spanish students going around the world going, hello, my name is Pedro, <laughs> then you know that they're, they're my students. Oh, hello. Yes. Is your teacher Keith? Uh, yes, it is. How do you know? <laughs> oh, I'm just guessing. Yeah. <laughs> just for practice. So that's the P. But then there's the party, R, R. So look at the shape of the mouth, ah. And now look at the English shape, ah, ah, ah. So you need to go from ah, ah. What happens, the lips become much more central, rounded, and the jaw drops. Pa, 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 pa. Pa. And then finally the T. The Spanish speaker would probably have a parti, T, T, but it's a T. The mouth you can see is much, much closer. So all together, party. Of course, the other difference is the Spanish speaker probably has the R, parti, parti. They're doing this, the sound, if you take the shape of the front of the teeth and their tongue is going par, ar, ar, par, par, par. Party. It's touching it. In English, there is no R. In British English, it's party. We don't pronounce the R at all. So that uh, ar, ar, the tongue must come back. Party. You don't even touch the teeth. The tongue comes right back. Party. So by seeing the shape of the mouth and the jaw, by understanding the position of the tongue, a coach or a teacher can help show you how to change and to move. And you can do this by looking and looking at videos. And if you follow a pronunciation course, you can learn lots and lots in this way. I think if you're just working on your own, a good thing is once you've got the sound to start to juggle and to practice. So if you've learned the p, p, practice p, p, pa, Pi, po, doesn't matter if they're real words, you're just practicing the sounds, right? P, P, Pi. Okay, and if you want <laughs> to throw in your piece of paper, P, P, Pi, potato, you can, right? Same with the R, R, car, ma, sa, ta, pa. Don't worry about the words existing, just practice those sounds. It's the gym, right? You're training your mouth to make these new sounds. Just doing it once is not enough. And just doing one sound is not enough. You need to be putting sounds together because that's what's really difficult, right? Yep. I can train you to say all 44 sounds, but if you can't put them together, Right? C up cup cup of tea. That's what you need to practice. So be juggling all the time as you learn these sounds. You can use the app I showed you before, practice those words and just make up your own, right? Play, play with sounds. That is what it really is all about. Now, coaches are not available for everybody, but fortunately nowadays online, you can find teachers and coaches all over the internet. And some of the best and most you know, trustworthy teachers that you can find are out there on Cambly. I'm a big fan of Cambly and the work that they do, and I would like to thank them again for sponsoring this video. Um, if you don't know Cambly, basically they are a platform where you can go and find native English speaking teachers. Um, you can have online classes one to one with your teacher um, where you can practice your English. You can practice IELTS questions 
And most importantly, you can develop your pronunciation, get feedback and help from a native speaker to really nail your pronunciation so that you can get that high score in IELTS speaking. The platform does have also um, online courses that you can follow, including some IELTS courses, lots of ideas to help you get uh, materials to study and to practice with your live teacher when you go on the platform with Cambly. If you join, um, Cambly have given us and you a code to get a discount on all of their packages. Just use the code you can see up here, Keith-Disc for discount. Um, and with that code, just put it in and you'll get the discount if you're a first time user, that is. So Cambly, great platform, great opportunity to practice your pronunciation. Go and check them out. Right now, let's get back to the content. There is another app if you're interested on, on practicing, getting the individual sounds. These are, it's not an app, sorry, it's a playlist on YouTube by the BBC Learn English Videos. They go through all 44 sounds and there's a, you can see the woman who is making the, vow, the, the mouth shapes. It's really a big help. It's well worth investing a few days going all the way through it, right? Next, word stress. Now, words are made up of different syllables, as you may know. Um, a syllable is basically a unit of pronunciation that is, well, it's a vowel sound that may or may not have a consonant before or after it. Okay. For example, the word two, right, has one syllable, two. Twenty, twenty has two syllables. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow has three syllables, right? Now, it's very important to stress the correct syllable. Of course, if there's just one syllable, like hat, it's easy. But when you have more than one syllable, like tomorrow, tomorrow, which one do you stress? Tomorrow, in that case, you stress the second one, right? Take, for example, Potato, <laughs> potato, right? We stress the second. And notice what happens to the first sound, po, becomes p, because when you stress something, you have to unstress the sound next to it, usually the sound before, but not always. So instead of potato, it's potato, potato. Now, if we put the stress in the wrong place in a word, it can lead to confusion, right? Let's put this to the test. I want you to write down these words, right? To see if you know what I'm saying. So go and get a pencil or a pen, or you can note it on your, um, on your iPhone or your Android phone. Listen carefully and tell me the word I'm telling you, okay? Listen carefully. Forget, forget, Saturday, Saturday, tomato, tomato. Did you get them? Did you understand the words? Because I was putting the stress in the wrong place. And if I change it, you might understand. So the first one should have been forget, right? Not forget, forget. Second one was not Saturday, it should have been Saturday. Stress on the first syllable, Saturday. The last one, tomato. What is a tomato? Oh, you mean a tomato, tomato. So can you see it's so important to get the stress right in the word or you're going to confuse people. I mean, imagine, right, if you walk into a greengrocer's in England, a greengrocer sells fruit and vegetable, right? And imagine you walk in and go, hello, I'd like a kilo of um, tomatoes, please. <laughs> and, and the shopkeeper goes, a kilo of what? Tomatoes. I'm sorry, we, we don't have any tomatoes here. No, no, really, the, the red, juicy ones. No, no, no tomatoes here. Sorry. Oh, come on. You, everybody has tomatoes in the salad. Oh, God. Oh, the, 
what on earth is this person talking about? We don't have any. I'm sorry. Oh, okay then. Well, just give me some um, potatoes. <laughs> potatoes. Potatoes. Great. So be careful next time when you look at your word stress. How do you get it right? Well, you look in the dictionary and it tells you which is the word, to, which is the syllable to stress. Um, and when you're making notes of words, right, always make a note of the stress, the word stress. You can do that by either just underlining like this, right, forget Saturday. Some people just write the stress in capital letters. Um, you can write a little circle on top of the stressed syllable, whichever works, but just make a note, right? <laughs> now, as I said before, notice it's important to unstress when you stress. So instead of saying for get, because you're stressing get, it's f, forget. That's how you make it work. Forget. Sat-er becomes sat-er. T Saturday, Saturday. Tomato becomes to, not two, but t. Tomato. Very often the unstressed syllable becomes the schwa sound, the uh. It's the most common sound in English, uh. Okay, so that's it. Let's have a look at some of the very, very common IELTS words you need to, pr to pronounce correctly. Um, how do you say these words? Right, okay. So you tell me, is this right or wrong? Photography. It's wrong, right? It should be photography. Stress on the top. Photography. The second one. The second one, right or wrong? Economics. Economics. It should be economics, economics, not economics, right? Economics. If I say economist, that's correct. And so I think you're saying economist. So notice these words of the same family often, sometimes, the stress, the word stress changes, whether it's a noun, an adjective or a verb. So be careful with these kinds of words. There is another really important group of words um, where a, a word can be both a noun and a verb, like re record or record. If the stress falls on the first syllable, it's going to be the noun, record. If it falls on the second, it's going to be a verb. Record. Record. Okay. So when you see words like these below, transport. The stress on the first is when it's a noun. If you say transport, transport, then it becomes a verb. Right? The same with import. We have a lot of imports. Imports. That's the noun. But if you put it on the second, import, import, then it's a verb. I'm going to import some cheese or some tomatoes from Spain. So that's a really good rule of thumb, right? A rule of thumb is a general rule. If it's a noun, stress the first syllable. If it's a verb, stress the second syllable. Simple, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Let's move on. Right, next up, sentence stress. Sentence stress is where we decide which word to stress in a sentence in order to express our meaning or maybe to express emphasis as well, right? Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a casino, right? In the casino, you can play blackjack, craps, um, that you can play the penny slot machines. Casinos, you know, 90% of people who gamble lose their money in the casino. In fact, there's only one person who wins and that's the casino. So be very careful if you go there. But imagine somebody, imagine I went to the casino, I gambled 
and I lost all my money, right? I could say, I lost all my money. Now, if somebody asks me, how much did you lose? I say, I lost all my money. If somebody says, whose money did you lose? I lost all my money. And if they say, what did you lose, Keith? I lost all my money. Can you hear that the word, the stressed, is different each time to give a slightly different meaning? So it's really important to look at this and to understand how we use it. In other languages, you may use words to emphasise, but we use stress to emphasise. It's also worth knowing that English tends to be, not always, but tends to be a stress-timed language rather than a syllable-timed language. So some languages um, are that the stress falls every syllable, right? Bum, 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 bum. In English, normally, the stress falls at the same time, not on every syllable, at the dum, da da dum, da da dum. You'll notice if you listen to my videos, I often say dum da da dum da da dum bum ba ba bum ba ba bum. You, the stress always coming at the same time. Let me show you very very three simple sentences. Right, listen. He lives in a big old house. He lives in a big old house. He lives in a lovely old house. He's been living in a lovely old house. Can you see the stress is the same every time? But there's lots more syllables, but we just squeeze the syllables in. And this is the secret to English sentence stress, right? Is you don't stress every syllable. You stress the most important words in the sentence. He's been living in a lovely old house. Living lovely house. Those are the key words, right? And in the same way, do you remember with the uh, tomato, <laughs> right? The tomato, in order to stress the ma, we unstress the tu, t, tomato. It's the same with sentence stress. The words that we don't stress are often contracted. They become weak, we, tell, we, we say. So, for example, this sentence, I go to work at 9 a.m. Now, many speakers who stress syllable have a, uh, a syllable stressed language would say, I go to work at 9 a.m. But in English, it's I go to work at 9 a.m. I go to work. We stress the go and the work, and so the two becomes t. You almost swallow it, mm. becomes t. I go to work at, at becomes at, at, at at 9 a.m. I go to work at 9 a.m. What time do you go to work? I go to work at 9 a.m. Where do you go? I go to work at 9 a.m. See? Sentence stress. Really important. That's a quick overview. Let's move on. Okay, I'm going to move on now and talk about weak and strong forms. And this is very closely connected, actually, to the sentence stress. Do you remember I said in a sentence you stress certain words and therefore you unstress the others? So when you unstress a word, we use what we call the weak form. So the words that we unstress normally are not the important words. Right. So we're not talking about nouns, adjectives and verbs. We're talking about the other smaller words that kind of connect your sentences. Um, so these are the main groups of words, right, where you have weak and a strong form. So verbs like to be, to have, um, can, would, should, will. Prepositions like to, at, for, from. Uh, conjunctions like and, but, than, pronouns like you, your, he, she, her, him, and so on. So all of these words have a weak form and a strong form, right? For example, to, T-O, the strong form is to, the weak form is t, to, t, 
And I'm often amazed at how many students don't know about the weak and the strong forms. And yet it is the crux of English pronunciation. It's so important, right? So let's take some examples to, to make this clear for you. Um, remember the, the, the sentence before, I go to work at 9 a.m., right? So we stress go and work. So I go to work, not to, but to work, and not at, but at, at, at. I go to work at 9 a.m., right? You've got it all. You've got the weak forms, the stress, and the dum da dum da dum I go to work at 9 a.m. I'll give you some more examples. Let's take um, was, 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 was. I was, I was, I was, I was. For, f, for, strong, f, weak. To, strong, t, weak. So let's have a look at this sentence, right? I was waiting for the bus to come. Which words do you think we will stress? That's right. Yes, waiting, bus, come. They're the key words, the verb, the noun. Those are, they carry the main meeting, the main meeting, the main meaning. The other words that we unstress, therefore, and use the weak form are. Yeah. Was, f, t. So the sentence is, I was waiting for the bus to come. Okay, break it down. I was waiting for the bus to come. Altogether, I was waiting for the bus to come. Can you hear that? Weak and strong forms. Again, we could look at all of the words and go through them, but that's a complete pronunciation course. This is just to give you an introduction so you're aware and you can start listening out for it. I think it's really good if you can watch videos with subtitles or the transcript, like the, the, the TED Ed or the TED Talks are great because you can see the transcript. So you can hear and be really listening for the for these words and picking out if you want to read. Oh, that's where they're reducing. They're using the weak form. Once you start listening out, you'll start waking up to the real sounds of English. And then once you can hear it, you can also start pronouncing it and working on producing it. OK, great. Let's move on. Right now, next up is connected speech. Do you remember we talked about three levels of pronunciation, right? We had the, the, the sounds level, kind of the phonemes, the consonant and vowel sounds. We then had the word level and we looked at word stress, changing the stress on the syllable. And then the third level is kind of the phrase or the chunk or the sentence level. So we looked at sentence stress. And another key part of that third level is connected speech. Many languages don't have this. Um, some do it to a different degree uh, to English. But in English, it's very common. We use it a lot. We don't always have to do it, but it's really good for you to start doing at least a little bit of connected speech if you're not doing any. So basically, this is where we have two words together and we link the sounds between the words. So typically, if a word ends in a consonant sound and the next word begins with a vowel sound, then we'll connect them, right? For example, wake, it ends in a k, k, wake. Up, the next word up, uh, uh, is a vowel sound. So instead of saying wake up, we say wake up. The k, and the uh come together, almost like way, cup, way, cup, wake up. They're connected. Can you hear the difference between I wake up and I wake up? You're making a chunk. It's so much easier to pronounce um, and it sounds so much, no so much more natural. Okay. Other common examples we may see, first of all, first, 
will link to the o and the of v the v remember o f is of with a v v all vol vol <laughs> watch the mouth vol remember first of all first of all so there's a vol the best way to do this is to go backwards repeat with me vol de vol first of all first of all a bit strange i know but that is linking another example on top of that same thing top of top of top of on top of that on top of that on top of that on top of that da, 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 da. so the most common occurrence is when you know you have a word finishing in a consonant sound and the next one begins with a vowel you can connect but you don't have to again i think it's really good practice for you to start listening out for this um, because once you start hearing it it'll become crystal clear it's extremely common in phrasal verbs right things like take out take out give up take on um, put away because most prepositions begin with a vowel right put away away and the way to practice is separate that final consonant and put it together with the second word put away Ta away take off take off take off your coat put away your shoes give away your money <laughs> why not so very nice that's connected speech now another very quick thing that you'll notice with connected speech it's not just linking there are also other strange and magical things happening we have um letters or sounds that disappear um letters and words that appear out of nowhere all sorts of things happen which i won't go into much detail but let me just tell you one where a sound disappears right and it's a very common one because it's one that a lot of students get wrong and it's the word must that finishes in a t right must so if we say i must go nobody speaks like that right i must go it's very very strange that t sound drops and disappears so it's actually i must go there is no t i must go you he must pay he must pay right forget the t it drops mm -hmm. so if you've got must and the next word begins with most consonant sounds not all of them then things like i must go he must pay i must listen more that t disappears very good one to learn because it's such a common modal verb there are many more but not for today let's move on right last but not least intonation now this is one of the most challenging parts of pronunciation and it's all about that third level we talked about about chunk phrase sentence level um, intonation is basically the change in pitch or tone across a sentence to give meaning in many languages you have different tones for different words and it changes the meaning of the word right for example in chinese you have ma 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 right and and others um, and it changes the meaning of the word in english the 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 tone or the pitch changes on a word but it affects the meaning of the whole phrase or the whole sentence that's the important thing right so we have i guess three basic kind of pitches we've got rising mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. falling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. falling rising mm -hmm. And you can also have actually rising falling mm. there are different kinds right i guess the main thing we're going to focus on is how these can be used to change the meaning of the phrase there are no strict rules for this right and that's what makes it really difficult um, i'm going to give you some rules of thumb 
thumb. A rule of thumb is a, a general guideline um, for certain ways of using them, but really it comes from practice. Okay, let, let, me, let me begin with a very, very simple example, right? Um, imagine I've been to the casino. <laughs> what, again? Yeah. And I get home and I've lost all my money, right? And I tell my missus, my wife, you know, I'm really sorry, but I've lost all my money, all our money. And she might say, well, that's great. I don't think she's going to say, well, that's great. Because, well, that's great. Rising means that it's great. It's very, very good. But the same words, well, that's great. Falling intonation means it's terrible, very, very bad. So that intonation is key on expressing the meaning. Let's look at some rules of thumb. First of all, questions. So generally, we've got two kinds of questions. We've got questions which are open, like what, where, why, who. Those open questions um, have normally a falling intonation, right? What time are you coming? Who are you going with? Where are you going? What are you doing? Dum, di, 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 dum, di, 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 dum. Usually those questions have a falling intonation. Um, the closed questions, kind of yes, no answer questions, normally have a rising intonation. Are you coming? Are you sure? Do you want some? Do you have time? Can you hear that? Are you coming? Do you want some? It's rising. So those kind of questions, right, normally it's rising. Um, what else? We've got lists. Sometimes in IELTS you might be giving a list of things. And the very common intonation pattern is rising, rising, falling on the last one of the list, right? Not always, and you don't have to do this, but it is a common recognised pattern, right? Do you like animals? Yeah, sure. I like elephants, tigers, and monkeys. Dee 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 dee. Right? I like elephants, tigers, and monkeys. Do you like animals? Right, exactly. Yes. Vegetables. I like carrots, bananas. That's not a vegetable. I like carrots, potatoes, and tomatoes. <laughs> Some of you are saying, Keith, tomatoes are fruit. I know. But not to worry, <laughs> this is a test of English, not a test of nutrition. So lists, right? That's very common to have that. The other one is um, conditionals. So very often conditionals, the first part goes up and the second part goes down, right? Um, if you win, you will get a prize. If you win, you will get a prize. So notice the intonation happens on the last word but it's affecting the whole sentence. Win, prize. If you win, you'll get a prize. If I were rich, I'd be very happy. Okay, so this is quite common with, con with many, many conditional sentences. Again, just to be clear, this is not a rule that you have to follow. Intonation is super flexible. It's just a rule of thumb. It's a guideline of common ways intonation is used. Right, as always, there's not enough time to give you more detail, but I hope I've given you a flavour of the importance of pronunciation and really what the pronunciation features are you need to be working on to get that band seven in IELTS speaking. It takes a lot of practice, it takes a lot of time, and it's all about training your mouth training your muscles, your lips, your tongue, your jaw, and the voice and unvoiced, which we haven't talked much about. Maybe I should do a series. Maybe I should make a course on pronunciation. I don't know. But I hope this is going to give you incentive and motivation to start discovering more. Go and have a look at the apps I've shared with you today and get cracking. Start levelling up your pronunciation today, okay? All of this is based on a British model, and that's because I'm British. It's perfectly fine to use uh, an American model. Um, if your teacher's American, of course, or Canadian or Australian, you're going to be adopting 
slightly different um, sounds. Do remember that accent is not important in IELTS speaking, right? Um, and it's not a British test. It's international English. It includes American English, Australian English, right? Um, all kinds of Englishes um, from around the world, as you'll know when you've done your listening practice. And the same for speaking. It doesn't matter about your accent so long as your pronunciation is clear and you have control of these pronunciation features. And you can now go and tell your friends, I know what the pronunciation features are. Look, Keith has told us. Go and share the good news. <laughs> As always, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's video. That's Cambly. Cambly is an online teaching platform where you can find a native English speaking teacher to help you with your, well, with your pronunciation. What a great opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so go and check them out. You can get a discount if you use the code, um, the code here, Keith-Disc. Uh, and with that, you'll get a discount on their offers um, for any or all of their packages. Take advantage, go and check it out. Thank you very much, Camberley. I hope you've enjoyed this um, video. Please do subscribe, turn on the notifications, um, share it with your friends and keep practicing. I can't wait to see you soon. If I haven't lost all my money down at the casino. <laughs> don't worry, I don't gamble. On a final closing note, I haven't done a pronunciation course, but I have done a fluency course. And the fluency course focuses a lot on intonation and pronunciation, actually. So if you want to go and check it out, it's up here. It's fluency for IELTS speaking. Um, the links are down below. There is a discount on at the moment. Go and check it out. It might be right for you. Go and see. Take care, my friends. All the best now. Bye bye.